Well, I want to welcome everyone to the class today. And seeing that we're at Houston Christian University, I think that it would be appropriate if we were to begin our class with a word of prayer and dedicate it to the Lord. Father in heaven, as we approach your being in nature, we do so in awe and trepidation. You are so great uh, beyond comprehension. And we pray, Lord, that as a result of this week together, our vision of you would be more profound, that we would understand more of your majesty and your greatness beyond what we have ever previously grasped. And so, Father in heaven, we commit to you this week of classes, these lectures, and ourselves to you as good students to wrestle with this material. And we will trust you then for a profitable time together. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, the course is on the section of systematic theology that is the doctrine of God, particularly the attributa dei, or the attributes of God. And as I note here, the existence and nature of God are central concerns of Christian theology. While the systematic theologian may not engage in natural theology, but simply assume on the basis of scriptural teaching that the God of the Bible exists, he cannot be indifferent to the question of the nature or attributes of the biblical God, since God's nature is determinative for the entire Christian theological system. Unfortunately, uh, in the words of the Lutheran theologian Robert Price, the doctrine of God is the most difficult locus in Christian dogmatics. Does God exist necessarily or contingently? Is he absolutely simple or complex? Is he timeless or omnitemporal? Does he transcend space or fill space? Does his almighty power imply the ability to do the logically impossible? Or are there limits to the range of his power? Systematic theologians have often assumed uncritically traditional answers to these sorts of questions, answers that have been sharply challenged in modern times. During the late 20th century, the concept of God became fertile ground for anti-theistic philosophical arguments. The difficulty with theism, it was often said, is not merely that there are no good arguments for the existence of God, but more fundamentally that the concept of God itself is incoherent. And it's here that the contribution of contemporary Christian philosophers to systematic theology has been most pronounced and helpful. The anti-theistic critique evoked a prodigious literature devoted to the philosophical analysis of the concept of God. And as a result, one of the principal concerns of contemporary philosophy of religion has been the so-called coherence of theism. Now, two controls have tended to guide this inquiry into the divine nature, scripture and so-called perfect being theology. With respect to the first, for thinkers in the Judeo-Christian tradition, God's self-revelation in scripture is obviously paramount in understanding what God is like. Still, while Scripture is our supreme authority in formulating a doctrine of God, so the doctrines contrary to biblical teaching are theologically unacceptable, contemporary thinkers have come to appreciate that the doctrine of God is underdetermined by the biblical data. <clears throat> 
the biblical authors were not philosophical theologians, but in many cases storytellers whose accounts of man's relationship to God uh, bear all of the marks of the storyteller's art, being told from a human perspective without reflection upon philosophical considerations. The biblical theologian will therefore search in vain for clear answers to many philosophical questions concerning the divine attributes like those I posed a moment ago. Answers taken for granted by traditional dogmaticians need to be brought anew before the bar of Scripture and their biblical support and consonance re-examined. Now, in addition to Scripture, St. Anselm's conception of God as the greatest conceivable being, in Latin, aliquid quod nihil maius cogitari posit, or most perfect being, ens perfectissimum, has guided philosophical speculation on the raw data of Scripture, so that God's biblical attributes are to be conceived in ways that would exalt God's greatness. The biblical concept of God's being almighty, for example, is thus to be construed as maximally as possible. John Hick, uh, my doctor father, aptly credits Anselm for bringing the Christian doctrine of God to full flower, he writes. Perhaps the most valuable feature of Anselm's argument is its formulation of the Christian concept of God. Augustine had used the definition of God as one than whom there is nothing superior. Anselm, however, does not define God as the most perfect being that there is, but as a being than whom no more perfect is even conceivable. This represents the final development of the monotheistic conception. God is the most adequate conceivable object of worship. There is no possibility of another reality beyond him to which he is inferior or subordinate and which would thus be an even more worthy recipient of man's devotion. Thus, metaphysical ultimacy and moral ultimacy coincide. One cannot ask of the most perfect conceivable being whether men ought to worship him. Here, the religious exigencies that move from polytheism through henotheism to ethical monotheism reach their logical terminus, and the credit belongs to Anselm for having first formulated this central core of the ultimate concept of deity. Unfortunately, the conception of God as the greatest conceivable being is not without its ambiguity. Yuji Nagasawa takes God to be the greatest metaphysically possible being, a view he calls the perfect being thesis. Nagasawa holds that the perfect being thesis need not be taken to entail that God is omnipotent, omniscient, or omnibenevolent, since those properties are a matter of philosophical dispute, but simply that God has the maximally consistent set of knowledge, power, and benevolence. He thinks that there are neither biblical grounds nor compelling philosophical arguments for the entailment of the omni-attributes in a philosophically strict sense. Now, that seems to me a dubious stratagem, since the maximal consistent set of attributes could describe a limited and finite God. Nagasawa's construal seems to rule out the incoherence of theism by definition. By contrast, Michael Almeida takes as a defining feature of perfect being theology the inference from the proposition that God is the greatest conceivable being to the conclusion that God has every property 
that it is better to exemplify than not. My own understanding and utilization of perfect being theology is more modest, what Almeida calls uh, a posteriori Anselmianism, which extrapolates divine attributes from Scripture as greatly as possible. Since the concept of God is underdetermined by the biblical data, and since what constitutes a great-making property is to some degree debatable, philosophers working within the Judeo-Christian tradition enjoy considerable latitude in formulating a philosophically coherent and biblically faithful doctrine of God. So philosophical theists have actually found that these anti-theistic critiques of certain conceptions of God can actually be quite helpful in framing a more adequate conception. And thus far from undermining theism, these anti-theistic critiques have served mainly to reveal how rich and interesting the concept of God is, thereby refining and strengthening theistic beliefs. So in what follows, we're going to explore some of the most prominent of the attributes traditionally assigned to God. According to the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation, God the Son does have a human body since the moment of his assumption of a complete human nature in Mary's virginal conception of Jesus, but rather that God is an immaterial being. Just as the human soul, whether embodied or disembodied, is taken by anthropological dualists to be immaterial, so God, whether bodiless or incarnate, is an immaterial substance distinct from the world. Now, in line with those two controls for doing systematic theology, let's consider first the biblical data concerning divine incorporeality. And here I want to summarize five lines of scriptural evidence in support of the view that God is an immaterial substance distinct from the world. Among the most important scriptural evidences for God's immateriality are passages affirming God's creation of the physical world, indeed of everything distinct from himself. The Bible opens with the majestic words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now we can note simply in passing that most scholars today recognize this statement to be an independent clause, not a subordinate clause, and moreover this verse is arguably not a title for the creation story since it is connected to verse 2 by the Hebrew word vav, and, and if taken as a title it would be inaccurate since the ensuing account does not in fact describe the creation of the earth. The author of the opening chapter of Genesis thereby differentiated his viewpoint from that of the ancient creation myths of Israel's neighbors. For the author of Genesis 1, no pre-existent material seems to be assumed, no primordial dragons or warring gods are present, only God who is said to create, bara, a word used exclusively with God as its subject and which does not presuppose a material substratum, the heavens and the earth, at Hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz, a Hebrew merism for the totality of the world, or more simply, the universe. Neither is the world said to have been created out of the divine substance as in some ancient Near Eastern myths. Moreover, this act of creation took place in the beginning, bereshit, used here in the absolute sense, uh, just as me-reshit from the beginning is used in Isaiah 46.10 to indicate uh, an absolute beginning. The conception of God in Genesis 1 is thus stunningly different from anything else in the ancient Near East. 
The dominant and distinguishing tenet of Hebrew thought, state Henry Frankfurt and A.J. Frankfurt, is the absolute transcendence of God. Nahum Sarna encapsulates the teaching of the biblical creation narrative thus, quote, its quintessential teaching is that the universe is wholly the purposeful product of divine intelligence, that is, of the one self-sufficient, self-existing God who is a transcendent being outside of nature and who is sovereign over space and time. The author of Genesis 1 thus gives us to understand that God is independent of and the creator of the material realm, thereby implying that he is not a material object. Now I then go on to explain how you can show exactly the same thing from the New Testament in John chapter 1 and verse uh, 3, which manifests uh, Middle Platonist uh, influence in its Logos doctrine of the Logos as the creator of the corporeal world. Uh, we don't know whether the author of the prologue to John's Gospel embraced a Middle Platonic doctrine of divine ideas, but whether or not he did, I think there's no doubt that given the similarity of his Logos doctrine to that of Middle Platonism, he understood the Logos to transcend the material realm and so to be immaterial in nature. So that strand of scriptural uh, teaching relating to God's creation of everything apart from himself supports divine incorporeality. Second, in addition to biblical passages like the above on divine transcendence and creation, passages expressing God's omnipresence are naturally interpreted to imply divine immateriality. Suffice it to say that biblically God is not thought to be located in a particular place as material objects are, but is said to be everywhere in space. If we think of divine omnipresence as God's transcending space while being cognizant of and active at every place in space, then divine immateriality follows at once since any material object is spatially located. On the other hand, if we take God to exist spatially, it would be implausible to think of him as extended throughout all space like the ether of 19th century physics. For them, parts of him would exist here and parts there, uh, which is certainly not the biblical notion of God's entire presence to anyone wherever he might find himself. Wherever anyone is in space, God is there to help him when called upon. If God is spatially located then, he must be wholly located at every region of space that he occupies, that is to say, at every region. In that case, he would have to be extended throughout space after the fashion of a myriologically simple object, having no proper spatial parts, but occupying multiple regions of space. Some Christian theists conceive of the soul to be so extended throughout the body, wholly present at every spatial subregion of the body, and have even suggested that God too may be extended throughout space, wholly present at every region. But these thinkers conceive God and the soul to be immaterial beings, and so to have no parts located at different places in space. How a material object could be spatially extended and yet simple is almost unimaginable, though some philosophers have defended such a notion. I think we can say with assurance that none of the scriptural writers affirm such a conception of God as an extended material simple. It's far more plausible that if they assumed God to be literally spatially present everywhere, it was because they thought that God was an immaterial spirit. Thirdly, the biblical descriptions of God 
as indiscernible to the five senses, confirm divine immateriality. The scriptures repeatedly testify that God is invisible. First Timothy speaks of Him, whom no man has ever seen or can see, and offers this doxology, to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be power and glory forever and ever. Amen. God's invisibility will naturally encompass not merely God's imperceptibility by eyesight, but also His imperceptibility by the rest of the five senses, such as touch and smell. So, skipping ahead, God's imperceptibility to the five senses, apart from His revelation in the world and His embodiment in Christ, is naturally accounted for by God's not being a physical object. Fourth, the Old Testament prohibition of making images of God is ultimately rooted in divine incorporeality. This prohibition is motivated not by the danger of inaccurately portraying God's material form, but more fundamentally in His lacking such a form altogether, so that physical images inevitably distort. Moses warns, Since you saw no form on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure. If you act corruptly by making a graven image in the form of anything, you will soon utterly perish from the land." God is not to be portrayed in paintings, in statuary, in any sort of visual image. Any sort of image, however beautiful, uh, however artistically inspiring, will diminish who God is by portraying Him in some necessarily limited corporeal way. And finally, fifth, God is described in Scripture as a spirit, which implies immateriality. Now, we needn't be distracted by the vast range of meanings of the Hebrew and Greek words ruach and pneuma, both translated as spirit. For our interest is not in the use of these words in a meteorological sense to designate the wind, or in a biological sense to designate the breath or vital force of an animate corporeal creature, but in the theoanthropological sense to designate intellectual substances, that is to say immaterial personal agents or spirits. Directly relevant to our concern is the use of ruach and pneuma to designate unembodied spirits. These are invisible, independent spirit beings other than God, including angels, demons, and other Elohim. Though they can assume bodily form that is not their natural state, Scripture refers to such spirits as divine beings, Elohim, or sons of God. Of the angels, the writer of Hebrews asks, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to serve? John calls angels spirits. Demons are sometimes referred to as unclean spirits or evil spirits. These spirit beings are different from God in that they belong to the created order and are finite in every respect. By contrast, the Spirit of God is not an angelic being or a finite heavenly being. He is never present in the heavenly assembly before the throne of God. Although ruach and pneuma are frequently used to denote God's power which comes upon men, the words are also used hypostatically to refer to God Himself as a personal agent. Kleinknecht explains that from the time of wisdom and Philo under Jewish and Christian influence, pneuma is cut off from its basic relation to nature, transcendentally spiritualized and hypostatized and personified, 
as an independent, personally living and active cosmological and soteriological spirit or God, sui generis. The appellation Holy Spirit is especially significant in this regard. Without getting drawn into a discussion of the doctrine of the Trinity, we can say that the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is not an impersonal power, but is God Himself, endowed with the properties of personhood such as intellect and will. Observing that the concept of a pneuma hagion is unattested in secular Greek literature, Kleinknecht asserts, here Biblical Greek has coined a new and distinctive expression for the very different supra-sensual, supra-terrestrial, and in part personal character and content which pneuma has in Judaism and Christianity. By contrast, he says, profane Greek knows no hypostatic person of the Spirit understood as an independent entity. In the Greek world, pneuma is always regarded as a thing, not as a person. But as the verses uh, cited in the next paragraph indicate, the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is not an impersonal force, but is, in fact, God Himself. So those five strands of scriptural teaching, I think, give um, solid basis for affirming the incorporeality of God. Now, what then shall we say about Scripture's abundant use of bodily descriptions of God? Well, such descriptions fall into two quite distinct categories. On the one hand, there are passages describing God anthropomorphically. Uh, such descriptions are very common in the Psalms, which speak of God's eyes and ears and uh, mouth and nose and even His wings uh, on occasion. On the other hand, there are biblical passages describing divine theophanies, God's manifesting Himself to human beings in bodily form. For example, Moses' vision of God's back. Now, with respect to the first category of text, these anthropomorphic descriptions of God, I think we should understand <clears throat> these anthropomorphic descriptions to be figurative rather than literal. And two considerations undergird this understanding. First, these descriptions serve a clear literary purpose. Uh, for example, 1 Peter 3.12, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those that do evil." Now clearly it would be inept to interpret such a passage literally, that somehow the eyeballs of God are resting on top of righteous people, or that the face of the Lord is up against those that do evil. Clearly the eyes and the ears and the face of the Lord are here meant as literary figures of speech. When the Scriptures speak of God's eyes, they are speaking of God's knowledge and regard. When they speak of God's ears, His attentiveness to certain persons is met. When they speak of God's face, they are referring to His presence, and so on and so forth. So these uh, metaphors serve a clear literary purpose. Second, if we were to take such anthropomorphic descriptions of God literally, then they would be mutually inconsistent. Uh, for God is differently described in these passages. In some passages, God is described in very human terms, but in others with wings or breathing fire. And therefore, it's obvious that we should understand these anthropomorphic descriptions of God in a metaphorical rather than literal way. So then what about the theophanies? Such cases, I think, are often plausibly taken to be visions, that is, mental projections of the percipient's mind, even though caused by God. Uh, in the case of Moses' vision of God's back, I think this is clearly a visionary experience that God gives to Moses. And then I give quite a number of other examples of visions 
uh, in the Old and New Testament that were not meant to be um, descriptions of something happening in the extramental realm. Nevertheless, there are theophanies that do not seem to be merely visionary experiences. In these cases, we do seem to have a temporary physical manifestation of God or a finite spiritual being for the sake of interacting with human actors. A noteworthy example would be God's appearance to Abraham in Genesis 18, um, where the three visitors to Abraham are provided a meal, which they then eat, uh, indicating that they are physically present. Presumably the meat, bread, and milk that Abraham saw them consume were gone after their departure. Similarly, uh, Jacob's uh, experience um, at Bethel might be explained as a vision. But his mysterious nocturnal encounter with a man at Peniel in Genesis 32 seems quite different because in this case we do have enduring extramental effects, um, such as Jacob's joint, uh, hip being put out of joint. This shows that the encounter uh, was not simply a visionary experience. So such uh, an encounter shows not that God has a human body, much less is a material object, but that he can manifest himself corporeally should he so wish. In sum, neither anthropomorphic descriptions of God nor theophanies of God in human form serve to subvert the teaching of Scripture that God is immaterial. Given God's transcendence of the world, his omnipresence, his invisibility, the prohibition of divine images, and his spirituality, we have solid scriptural basis for affirming God's incorporeality. While we're waiting for questions from the in-person audience, we do have a couple questions that have been submitted online. One from Nate, if the creation includes man, whom dualism claims is composed of an immaterial and material substance, how would God being independent and creator of creation imply that God is immaterial? I don't see the force of the question. Um, what is implied in Genesis 1-1 is that God brings the entire material universe into being, and he already exists without it. Uh, and the fact that the creation would include finite immaterial spirits is no reflection on his transcendence or incorporeality. Any questions from the audience here? I actually here? have three uh. that are somewhat separate. Uh, one of them, concerning the exegesis of Genesis 1-1, Moses Maimonides, uh, also known as Rambam, makes the explanation that Rashid is not uh, chronological time, but preeminence, citing Numbers 24, 20, as Amalek was the Rashid of the nations. Yes. And he was not chronologically prior, prior to the rest of the nations. And so first pushback is what would you say to that? Yeah, I think in the context, it is clearly talking about temporal priority. It is the absolute beginning of the created order. And then you have the days enumerated, day one, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, uh, and so on. So it seems to me in context quite clearly that it's talking about temporal priority. Um, this is not based upon the meaning of the word reshit. In English and in Hebrew, you can talk about beginning in the sense of rank, for example, or importance. That, that's certainly true. But the question is, in context, how is it best explained? I think in the beginning here indicates a temporal beginning. Okay. Uh, second one, if I'm permitted. Uh, yes. You mentioned God being spatially, uh, uh, how did you say it? Some Christian theists see, conceive God as a soul being extended throughout the whole body of the person. You know, I'm not going to quote everything. Um, but how would you avoid the classic Stoic pantheism in that sense of God being a permeation of the physical? 
Well, it would be that unlike the Stoic conception of spirit as a kind of thin, ethereal substance, God is immaterial. He's like a mind that is extended throughout the universe um, and wholly present at every place in the universe. On the Stoic conception of spirit as a sort of uh, thin substance throughout the universe, it seems to me that it would not be wholly present at any place in space, that there would be part of it there and part of it elsewhere. So in order to be wholly present at every place, I think it's plausible that God would need to be immaterial, like the soul in the body. And finally, uh, you mentioned Jacob's encounter at Peniel, yes. uh, which classic <clears throat> Jewish and Hebrew exegesis uh, would not state that that was the Lord <clears throat> uh, because the divine name of God is not mentioned there anywhere in that passage. Uh, but the classic Jewish conception is that Jacob was actually wrestling with Samael, who was the guardian angel of Esau, and with the context of the passage being sandwiched between Jacob running from Esau and Jacob making peace with Esau, that seems to be coherent. So the question concerned the encounter of Jacob uh, with the man at Peniel. Um, could this have been not an encounter with God, but with some sort of principal angelic being? Um, as Jewish exegetes claim. As Jewish exegetes have claimed. I don't carry any brief for saying this had to be the Lord. Uh, if it was an angel, it would be an example again of taking on a material form, um, which is the main point that I'm wanting to make. But I must say that when you read the passage, um, the person asks Jacob what his name is, and he renames Jacob uh, and calls him Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then when Jacob says, tell me your name, the person uh, says, why is it that you ask my name, and simply refuses to answer. And so Jacob calls the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. So it seems as though it's presented as a materialization of God himself and not just a lower angelic being. All right, let's turn to a question from the online audience from Leonard Kraft. Should we understand God's interactions with Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3 uh, as temporary physical theophanies, of course, told in the mytho-historical genre? I argue against that position. I think that that would be an example of an anthropomorphic description of God walking in the garden, forming Adam out of the dust, taking a rib from his side to shape a woman, uh, and that these should not be understood as materializations of God. And I would argue that for two reasons. First, it doesn't have the language of theophany. Uh, for example, in Genesis 18, in the Theophany of Abraham, it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. There's nothing like that in Genesis 2 and 3 to indicate that this is some sort of theophany to Adam and Eve. But secondly, and decisively, God is described anthropomorphically in Genesis 2 and 3 when he is not appearing to Adam and Eve. Uh, when he shapes Adam out of the dust of the earth and forms him, Adam doesn't yet exist. So that can't be a theophany to Adam. When he forms Eve, he makes Adam unconscious and forms Eve out of the rib of his side. So again, that can't be a theophany. So it seems to me that what you've got there are uh, quasi-mythical, anthropomorphic descriptions of God that the author of the Pentateuch knew was incompatible with the presentation of the transcendent God of Israel in Genesis 1.1. Here's a quick question from the online audience from Steve Krutz. Can you clarify the difference between saying God is, quote, without a body versus saying God is, quote, immaterial. 
it seems that these descriptions are synonymous. Oh, oh, not at all. Think of the soul here. The soul is an immaterial substance, but the soul may have a body. Yeah, it can be incarnate, and then it can lose the body in death, and the soul could exist in a disembodied state. So whether the soul is embodied or disembodied, the soul is not a physical substance. It's not identical with its body. Um, and similarly with the incarnation. Uh, in the incarnation, the person of the second person of the Trinity assumes a human nature so that he has a human body, but he is still the immaterial God uh, who has assumed that nature and he still has all the properties of deity. Maybe one more question from the audience here, and then we'll move on. Uh, I'm not aware of any biblical case for God not being immaterial. Or is there a reason why someone would argue against uh, the case you may not think today? So he's not aware of any case against God's incorporeality, so is there any reason that we're arguing this? Um, it would be based upon these anthropomorphic descriptions of God in bodily terms and the theophanic appearances of God in corporeal terms. That would be the only grounds for thinking that God is a physical or material object. And I, I think that those are extraordinarily weak arguments, even taken in isolation, but taken in the whole context of Scripture, um, those five strands of teaching, it seems to me uh, that those do not provide good reason for thinking that God is a material being. 